I just got <clears throat> show how the libertarian free market network <clears throat> is expensive and all pervasive. Uh, when I got to Fred's house today and I came in from the, my plane rides, um, I was handed a letter from somebody at Stanford who had a, just got a, had seen a newspaper article on, on Polish economy and he wanted me to have it as I spoke. I mean, that's really, that's terrific, you know, with a, with a budget of $2, the libertarian movement, it's going pretty, doing pretty well. The, uh, <clears throat> uh, socialism is, uh, is now, I think, intellectually uh, and even uh, as reputation in general is, is, is dead from the neck up. Uh, the uh, socialism used to be defined, I would still define it, I mean, if you want to define socialism, as the government ownership of the means of production, <clears throat> okay, or at least control of the means of production, ownership in the sense of uh, being able to dominate and, and uh, use the means of production. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, and the, the interesting thing about the, the socialist system, since half the world is now socialist uh, in this sense, the interesting thing about socialism is that as, as, each, as one after the other country went socialist, the socialists in the United States said, that's not socialism. That's not what I meant by it. I meant something much more humanistic and, and lovable. And so each socialism, uh, each record, each empirical record of socialism has been repudiated in, in, in turn. <clears throat> so that we have a very peculiar situation where the socialists in, this, in, in the Western world keep saying, that's not socialism. If you keep, you know, go down the record, okay, let's see what Cambodia did, for example, under Pol Pot, you know, killing one-third of the population, et cetera, et cetera. That's not social. That's not what we meant by socialism. We meant by socialism something that people sit around and read uh, Plato. <clears throat> So, the, uh, they keep denying the responsibility <coughs> for the consequences of their own position. <coughs> the socialism, I don't think, has a very good reputation anymore. And certainly in the Eastern European countries, I'll get to that in a second, in a minute, <coughs> um, doesn't have a very good reputation either. Probably a less good reputation than, than it does here. <coughs> the, uh, the article I was sent from, was from the Los Angeles Times for December 26th, which deals with says, rules bent to work Poland's crazy quilt economy. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a dateline from Warsaw, Los Angeles Times. It starts off by saying that <clears throat> the manager of a coal mine in Silesia was one official praise and bonuses for the mine's impressive production. But that was before the authorities discovered he had ordered his workers to mix rock with the coal pulled out of the mine to boost production figures. Uh, uh, and this sort of, sums, sort of sums things up in... in in a, um, in a socialist country, you don't have a real price system. I'll get to that in a little later, too. You don't have a price system. You can't, there's no profit and loss test. And so almost inevitably, the socialist managers decide on quantitative figures. You must produce, you produce, you know, X million board feet of lumber or, or of uh, coal in this, in this case. Well, okay, if, you, if, the, if the, the managers who are quite intelligent, they know that their brownie points, if they, get, if, they, they get, if they produce a lot of board field lumber, or a lot of coal, they get promoted or get raises. If they produce less, they get demoted or maybe sometimes go to the, go to the rock pile. So they, they, they do their best. They're in the incentive, the economic incentive they have is to boost quantitative figures, <clears throat> even if half the people sort of break their leg in the attempt. In the case of coal, if you mix rock with coal, you obviously can get more coal per unit effort. So that's what they did. In the case of the Soviet Union, years ago, they, they measured by board feet. You must produce, you produce, you know, X million board feet of lumber. So they produced X million board feet, except they were very, very narrow pieces of lumber. Okay? So, uh, <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if you don't have a, or they produce nails, the nails buckle every time you try to hammer, hammer, hammer the nail. So you have a situation where, if you go by quantitative figures, you always get messed up. <clears throat> Not in the sense of the Polish disease. Uh, and they go on to say, it's kind of cute, as one new Westerner in Warsaw put it about Poland, about the crazy, quote, economic regulations, everybody's ripping off everybody else, and since government agencies are the biggest and most tempting targets, they are being ripped off more than anyone else. Okay. <clears throat> um, and they had done this by pure, you know, by mineral, quantitative coal production and all that, and so this is what happened. So uh, this is just one indication, one small microcosm of what happens in socialist countries in general. <clears throat> the, uh, the managers take over. Indeed, there's nobody else to take over. The managers, are, there's no price system, there's no rational economic allocation. And so the managers take over 
and run things on the basis of what the central planners, uh, what rules the central planners lay down, whether it's board feet or tons of coal or whatever. Um, one interesting thing is, and one of my least favorite economists, John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, uh, claims that the uh, in the United States the managers have taken over. They're really running things. The stockholders don't or don't matter. The managers are operating the corporations for their own purposes. Well, I think it's a lot of baloney. But the point is, there is a, there is an area of the economy, both in the United States and the rest of the world, where this happens. The managers have taken over, which somehow Galbraith never mentions, namely government. Um, gov government agencies, government bureaus, the post office, and all of Poland, and all of Russia, and everything else. These are, this is the managerial revolution. Managers have taken over. They've messed everything up, quite, quite clearly. Uh, I remember, by the way, when I was, when I was growing up, <clears throat> there used to be radio debates uh, and about socialism versus capitalism. And they usually have a social, the socialist was usually Norman Thomas, who ran seems like 20 times for president. Must have been less than that. Anyway, it seemed like it. Perennial Socialist Party candidate for president. And the capitalist was always some, well, I guess I shouldn't say dumb, but less than articulate congressman <laughs> somewhere, right? Republican congressman. And these were, <laughs> this would be, <laughs> this would be the, uh, you know, the opposition. And the, and the socialist, Norman Thomas or whoever, would say the following. Look, we don't want to threaten anybody. All we want is a world run like a post office. <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, and governments run, government has to run the post office right, right. Of course, the Republican Congress, congressmen always say, of course, government has to run the post office. And then Th Norman Thomas, whoever, always win the debate. And of course, nobody would ever say that now. The post office is so messed up uh, that no socialist would dare to say we want the world run like the post office. Because, of course, the post office is a situation where not only the prices keep going up all the time, which is true in general, prices always go up for reasons which I can't go into, but it's caused by government, believe me. Trust me on that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> prices always go up, but also the, qu the quality always goes down. At least in private enterprise, the quality of, of products usually goes up. Computers get better, and TV sets get better, and whatever. Uh, but government, well, the post office, of course, the quality is always going down. So the quality of service. Uh, the, um, <clears throat> I remember, I was, I'm old enough to remember uh, one of the few advantages of being, of being older is that you can still remember what happened 40 years ago. I, I can remember quite clearly that they used to pick up the mail and deliver the mail twice a day in your apartment. Twice a day. Once at 9 a.m. and once at 1 p.m. Uh, now, of course, that's all shot, and Saturday mail is next to go, of course. And, and uh, so uh, there's a constant decline in service along with, and of course, the mail takes longer to get there. Uh, friends of mine in Canada are tearing their hair out. The postal service is even worse than here. Also, of course, socialized postal service. Where it literally takes three weeks to get a letter from here to Canada. Okay, so I'm not talking about out, out, out on the tundra you know, with, a, with, a, with the Eskimo. I'm talking about in the cities. <laughs> All right, at any rate, <clears throat> the, um, that's another thing. Since I'm on Galbraith, anyway, I'll, I'll tangentially admit it's a tangent. That's my, one of my favorite topics. Galbraith and the affluent society is always attacking advertising, the evils of advertising, how people get sucked into buying products because they see pretty girls using Diet Pepsi. <laughs> and <laughs> so they rush out to buy Diet Pepsi because they think they can win all these pretty girls and then they, they keep drinking it. Uh, the, the real, I don't know anybody who buys Diet Pepsi for that reason, but anyway, let's set that aside. <clears throat> the really fraudulent advertising is government advertising. Politicians who claim they're going to cure this, that, and the other thing never do it. And, uh, and all the rest of it. And, and Galbraith never mentions that. Never. Never in his book does he talk about government advertising, which is a real fraudulent area, because that's the area where the consumers have no check. See, if, 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 if somebody holds up Diet Pepsi and say, boy, that's good, and you rush out and say, boy, if, if, if this pretty girl likes it or if, if, uh, if Too Tall Jones likes it, you'll rush out and buy it because they like it. I mean, if you have, you're really a moron, maybe you think that way. <laughs> And you rush out and, and drink it. If you don't like it, that's the last Diet Pepsi you'll ever drink. Okay. okay. In other words, there's a market test for Diet Pepsi. If it works in your sense, then you'll keep buying it. If it doesn't work, you won't buy it. There's no market test for government. Uh, it's all very cloudy. Every four years, you, you, you elect somebody who's about the same as somebody else, and then four years later, you've forgotten what he said. Because it's all one big four-year package deal. The consumer, in other words, the voter, has no chance to vote on specific issues. 
So there's the real fraud. There's the real advertising problem. Galbraith never mentions it. Never, ever, ever. Not only Galbraith, but any, all the other Galbraithians. <coughs> okay, that's uh, the end of the, my Galbraith lecture. Um, okay, the, the, the basic, in socialism, getting the, getting the more theoretical aspect of socialism in general, the socialists have always realized that they have a problem. Okay, they've always realized. I'm, th I'm talking about Pol Pot and embarrassing things like that. They've always realized for, for many years they have a basic economic problem. Namely, as it used to be summed up when I was growing up, who's going to take out the garbage? <laughs> okay? <laughs> the socialist society. If everybody gets equal income, uh, et cetera, et cetera, everybody does what he wants to do, whatever it is, who's going to take out the garbage? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, it's a very profound question. It's essentially the incentive problem. Who's gonna, who, who will have the incentive to go out there and shovel garbage eight hours a day or ten hours a day or whatever? <clears throat> and uh, this is, uh, I say, this, is, this has been recognized by the, by the socialists. Because the, the basic socialist view is, the basic really gut socialist view is, uh, is summed up in the famous Marxian slogan, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. Now we have to add her, her ability, her needs to this. Okay. So everybody contributes to sort of like a common heap. Everybody works very, works very hard for the collective and contributes his or her production of a common heap, whatever the production is, uh, as, as, as fast as he can because he's working for the collective, and then he takes out whatever he needs. Okay? Sounds terrific, maybe. It doesn't sound terrific to me, but maybe to some people it sounds terrific. At any rate, uh, this, the socialists, sort of, the, the more sophisticated socialists, immediately recognize they had a problem here. Problem? It's kind of a negative incentive here. In other words, if you're a member of a huge collective who's going out and working hard and contributing to the heap, the incentive is not to work very hard, to sort of goof off and sleep behind, schnooze behind the tree, and then zip in and get you and acquire your needs. Okay? Uh, <laughs> because whatever you do doesn't contribute much to the common heap. It contributes maybe one one millionth. If you work very hard, you contribute one one millionth more to the common heap. It's nothing. It's peanuts. On the other hand, uh, you can grab from the common heap. You, that's you know, it's 100 percent for your your own consumption. So that's a real problem. It's, a, it's an obvious problem. Who's going to take out the garbage in social society? Uh, there's a couple of little examples of this I can mention. So sort of interesting. Uh, when the United States was founded, rather when America, North America, was founded, the first two colonies were Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts and the Jamestown Colony in Virginia. Both of them engaged immediately in communism. I'm using communism in a, in a small c, in other words, a philosophic sense. In other words, they both had a communal, they were run by a corporation from England, and everybody, there was no private property, everybody's supposed to contribute to the common heap, whatever grain he grew and all that sort of stuff, and then take whatever he needed from the common store. They, they engaged in, in a pure communist system. Not only did it work, but everybody was starving <coughs> as a result. Uh, and the thing is, it didn't work even though everybody knew they were starving. There only, first of all, there weren't 20, 200 million people in Jamestown. There were only a couple of thousand. It still didn't work. In other words, everybody, even though everybody knew in their gut they didn't produce more wheat, they'd starve, everybody knew in his heart, despite all the exhortations by the head of the colony, and all the moral injunctions, they knew what each person knew in their heart. I mean, if I, could, if I work 20 hours a day, it's not going to contribute much to the common heap. So what the hell with it? But if I grab from the common heat, it contributes a lot to me. So the result is nobody worked much and everybody grabbed. The result, not, no more wheat left. Okay. So we had a fundamental situation where both in Jamestown and in, and in Plymouth Rock, the colony almost died out from starvation. Finally, driven to the in extremis, even though it went against their ideological preconceptions, the heads of the, the governors of Plymouth Colony and Virginia said, well, gee, I'm sorry, folks. They use much more elegant 17th century language. I'm sorry, folks. I guess we have to have private property. And we will now have every person having you know, 30 acres or whatever it is. Each person will get whatever he, 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 uh, he grows. And bingo, presto, changeo, the colony flourished, starvation was over, and everybody was prosperous. Now, this, was a, this, was a this made a tremendous impact, a sort of a practical impact on the and the American colonists, because they saw it right away. Communism leads to starvation, and private property leads to prosperity. It was a very simple uh, sort of a controlled experiment, in a sense. Okay? So I, uh, that's one point I will mention. Another interesting point, which is purely fictional, but it's kind of interesting anyway. A beautiful, very, very funny novel appeared a couple of years ago by Sarah McFadden called Serial, about Marin County and the crazies who infest it in California. <laughs> 
And um, and she went to uh, she went to an urban commune. In other words, uh, lived in a house with 20, 10 people or something, none of whom knew each other, but they were all supposed to be communal. And uh, she noticed very quickly that there's one guy there who never washed his own dishes. We always left it to the com- rest of the commune to wash his dishes. And, and when she challenged him on that, she, he said, I'm not into dishes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, think <laughs> I don't know anybody who is into dishes, but at any rate, that commune collapsed pretty quickly too. And this is only like 10 people, it's not, it's not even a couple, several hundred. The, uh, okay, so the incentive then is negative. And the socialists, I think, have realized for a long time they have an incentive problem. What, what, did they, what then to do about it? Well, there's several ways of handling it. In, in the New Left period, it was quite common to say, well, it's true, everybody should get according to his needs, but we scale down the needs. I know who's the we here. I mean, it gets kind of fuzzy. Everybody should have very little needs. You see, if everybody had, we're willing to subsist on only yogurt and uh, uh, dried nuts and uh, whatever, and electronic guitars, of course, then it has to come in too. Uh, then we wouldn't need much, and then the whole problem would be sort of eliminated. Uh, I don't think that's going to get very far either. The, uh, the one problem with that is, you see, who determines who, who needs what? The, uh, I was arguing with a socialist one time, and he said, well, we, we will have a, um, we will have, okay, we'll have a computer. We established a socialist commonwealth. The computer will figure out, we we'll plug in everybody's needs, and we we'll assign the needs to everybody. And it's all very simple. You don't need any prices of private property. And I say, yeah, but I need a lot of things, baby. I need yachts, and I need, <laughs> I need 10,000 books, and, uh, you know, big stereo sets. Uh, and how about that? He said, well, of course, needs have to be reasonable. <laughs> uh, the other question is, who defines who the other person's reasonable needs? Obviously, some damn collective at some, at some committee or whatever is going to define, you need such and such. Well, I think this guy, he doesn't need to go with such and such. And you wind up with a totalitarian system. Uh, okay. The, um, but... Even if you do that, so what, so what about the supply problem? How do, you, how do you get people to work hard if they, if they know they're not gonna, they're not gonna each, they, they themselves are not gonna benefit much? It's all gonna go to the collective. Um, and so the basic socialist answer to that is it's quite, well, it's, it's simple in theory, it's not so simple in practice. The basic socialist answer to that, the way we overcome the incentive problem is by creating and transforming human nature. Create the new socialist man, capital N, capital S, capital M, or the new socialist woman. The new socialist man will be different. He or she won't be acquisitive, won't be interested in, won't be worried about the fact that if he works 20 more hours, he'll get only one, one peanut. <laughs> uh, he will be happy and proud and, and honored to work for the collective, work his guts out for the collective. Right? And that's the sort of man we have to transform. This is, I think, the basic reason why Soviet Russia and China, etc., Cambodia, whatever, tried, when they got in, they tried using every sort of coercive method well, obviously, it has to be court. How, are you gonna, how else are you going to do it? Uh, to try to use all sorts of brainwashing, torture methods, to try to transform human nature fast, to try to shape everybody up to become, to make the, have this mold of a new altruist man who will then work hard for the collective. I remember, uh, uh, fortunately for us, that, even that didn't work. <clears throat> I remember uh, I saw a fellow traveling movie about China about 20, 10, 15 years ago, uh, where everybody was a chilling series of interviews by the uh, interviewer with a supposed to, be, supposed to be a typical Chinese family, and they said, well, what do you want your children to be when they, when they grow up? And they said, we want them to work hard for the collective. You know? And the question is, if, do they really mean it? Um, uh, were they really brainwashed to that extent? Was, 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 a spirit of, was the human spirit so, uh, so uh, deteriorated and smashed that they really thought this way? Were they really robots? Well, fortunately, uh, my, my, my friend or acquaintance, Gordon Tullock, who's some of you may know as a distinguished economist, he started off in life as a Chinese expert. He was a China hand in the State Department, uh, and was then prisoner of Chinese communists when they took over in 1949. Anyway, so I asked him, well, you're a China expert. Are these, are the Chinese really, are they, 600 million Chinese, they really love the state? No, no, forget it. He says, an ancient Chinese tradition, they always tell the boss, you know, the, somebody coming from Peking or Nanking, they always tell him what he wants to hear. On the local level, they think it's all baloney. Of course, it turns out they were, he was right, in other words. It turns out, after 20, 30 years of brainwashing, uh, the free market is making an enormous, remarkable comeback in China. The, you know, the guys who are responsible for the 
so-called uh, transformation of the new socialist man now in jail or being locked up and being in uh, prison or whatever. <clears throat> so this, um, so this, but see, this comes right in. If you're, you're supposed to be working hard not to get, this is, in, in the socialist world, this is the so-called argument between material incentives and moral incentives. Uh, the new socialist man will, will not be interested in mere material income. He or she will work his guts out for moral incentives. What's the moral incentive mean? Well, it means like a medal, hero of Stahanovite labor, or hero of the Chinese Revolution. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, it doesn't, it's, fortunately, it didn't seem to work. And um, the, uh, the moral incentives have always collapsed. This was the big debate between, in Cuba between Castro and Che Guevara, Che Guevara being in favor of moral incentives, and finally they had to get sort of sent him off to Bolivia to get shot, <laughs> and uh, shift it over to material incentives. So it seems pretty clear then that the, uh, that this, the new socialist man hasn't worked. There, has, there is no new socialist man. There's, there's just a bunch of people who are looking for material incentives and trying hard to get it. Friends of mine who were Russian experts who visited Russia recently said that uh, nobody believes in this junk anymore. Nobody, nobody's a Marxist in Russia anymore. They don't believe in the government. They're all purely cynical. They just, they're just caught in this bureaucratic thing. They're trying to do they, the best they can within this, uh, you know, this maze, <coughs> which I think links up to all the other information we were getting out of there. <coughs> uh, at any rate, the, now this is, this, this new socialist man solution, which turns out to be faulty to say the least, is really the origin of the old theory, which you don't hear so much anymore, but I, I heard when I was growing up. Socialism is beautiful in theory, but can't work in practice. Socialism is the moral position, and it's beautiful and moral, but somehow doesn't work. It's impractical. Okay. Um, I mean, after Pol Pot and Stalin and Mao and so forth, it doesn't seem so beautiful anymore or even so moral. <coughs> but, so you don't hear that much anymore, but this is the, or the origin of that, because in other words, the idea is we're trying to transform human nature. We're trying to get everybody to work their guts out for the collective. And... If we fail, it's because human nature is recalcitrant. Okay, it doesn't seem to work. Okay, uh, without going into the uh, moral critique of Pope Pine, as far as I'm concerned, working your guts out collective is not very moral, quite the contrary. But I don't, I'm, uh, I'm here as an economist rather than as a moralist. So <clears throat> I will press on to saying this, that the, the real problem of socialism hasn't even been touched, hasn't even been touched yet. Because the real, the real interesting thing here is, from an economic point of view, is that even if you transform socialism, even if you created a whole bunch of 200 million robots in Russia and 500 million, 800 million robots in China and all that, and they're all out gung-ho to work for the collective, they didn't care, let, them, let their throats be cut as long as the collective, as long as the sugar crop increased by 2%. Even there, what are they going to do? So even if, even if you got them, even if you transformed them, even if you solved the incentive problem, these poor people, who were two billion people who were trying to work for the collective, they wouldn't know what to do. How are they going to work for the collective? What are they going to do? Should they grow sugar? Should they grow wheat? Should they make machines of some sort? Should they, uh, you know, grow copper? I mean, mine copper. Who's going to tell them what to do? How do they know what to do? They don't know the damn thing what to do. All they know is they should work hard. Let's say they absorb that. Okay? Well, work hard. What are they going to work hard at? Blank out. Nobody knows. And the problem, the, the economic problem with socialism is the government doesn't know either. <clears throat> There's no rational way of figuring out what these people should be doing. After you finally brainwash them to, and transform their nature, supposedly, they don't know what to do. They're gung-ho, they, they, you know, tell me, point me to something. <laughs> Nobody knows what to tell them to do. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, because there's no price system, there's no private ownership of the means of production, there's therefore no price system, there's therefore... No way that anybody, any government planner can tell what's scarce and what isn't scarce. For example, supposing, supposing the United States, supposing the world was collectivist, we we're in a world communist state. There's no market anywhere. Black markets have been stamped out. Actually, the only, way, the only reason why Russia exists right now is because they have a vast black market. <coughs> anyway, so name that aside. And the, in America, the planners in Washington are trying to decide what to do. What do we do? You know, where do we allocate resources? And somebody says, I think it'd be a great idea if we build a platinum and gold line tunnel from New York to San Francisco. Why not? Okay. Uh, well, so what's the problem with that? Well, uh, you might say it's too costly. What do you mean too costly? How do you know what the costs are? Nobody knows what the costs are. Nobody knows what the cost of platinum would be or gold or anything else. 
I mean, no way of comparing. I mean, let's assume it's technologically feasible to do it. There's no, there's no way of deciding whether that's better or whether you should build a couple of steel plants somewhere or strip mine something. Nobody knows anything because it's all vast, a sea and a fog of, of, of pure chaos. <clears throat> The, uh, this this uh, insight was first provided to the world by my mentor, Ludwig von Mises, in his article in 1920. And uh, <clears throat> the, uh, it set the socialists on, in, on their ear in, in Europe. The, uh, and they had all sorts of very complex solutions on how to try to solve this problem. We'll create a kind of a market. We'll pretend it's a market. We'll tell everybody it's play market. This is what it really amounts to. This is the longer, famous longer solution. We order to the managers, we tell the socialist managers, go out there and pretend you're only, you're only your, your corporation and play market, right? And then, then you'll have an exchange and all that sort of stuff. Obviously, playing market is sort of like playing Monopoly or something. It's really pointless, ridiculous. Uh, the market only exists if you're really committing your resources, if you're willing to sacrifice some resources to get something else. If I'm willing to shell out 25 cents for the New York Times, that's a market. If I'm willing to pay $10,000 for some machine, that's a market. Play money doesn't make it. Because anybody can do that. I mean, I can be a whiz if, if I, mean, I can invest $2 million in plain money in the stock market. I don't care what happens. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> this is, um, and, and, the, and, the, and the longer solution, longer learner and these people were trying to come up with a so-called economic uh, market argument for socialism, uh, really s stuck the consumer good. They kept saying, well, there's no real problem. You produce a cert certain number of, one piece, certain number of pieces of bubble gum, and you have a stock of bubble gum. If you want to know what the price is, you raise the price. And if you find out there's too much bubble gum around, you lower the price. And if you find out there's too much uh, that's going too fast, you raise the price. You sort of adjust the price on the basis of inventory. Okay? So that's, you know, there's no problem. What's, what, what are you bellyaching about? Well, this is fine, provided you've already produced the bubble gum. In other words, on a consumer good level, you can do it. <clears throat> you, can, you, can, you can produce a certain amount of bubble gum, a certain amount of gear shifts and wonder bread and whatever. And then you can adjust the consumer price on the basis of whether the inventory is being cleared or not. But how do you know how, to, how much to produce in the first place? How do you know how much bubble gum to produce or wonder bread to produce to begin with? You don't know. That's the whole point. There's no, because there's no producer's good market. There's no market for capital goods, for raw materials. Everything is chaos until you get to the consumer goods market. <clears throat> so this, uh, this inside of Mises was written, never really answered by the uh, socialists. <clears throat> Um, the one point always struck me also, and I read the long and learner of these people and trying to say that socialism can calculate. Um, one point that struck me was if they're so long, I kept saying, well, look, we can duplicate the market. We can make it in such a way, et cetera, et cetera. And this thing that struck me when I was reading it in college, well, if he's so anxious to duplicate the market, why not have the market to begin with? Forget about all the socialism junk. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it seemed simpler to do it that way at you know, the very, very best. At any rate, um, the, um, and so supposing, for example, make it concrete, let's take allocation of labor under socialism. I've, I've talked about allocation of consumer goods. Let's take labor, because we've talked about that already, working gung-ho for the, for the state. Um, supposing, supposing I come around and the, the committee, because some committee is going to allocate my labor, right? And there's a socialist planning committee. We're going to find out what my needs are and where I should best serve, serve society or the collective of the state. I come to them and say, look, well, gee, fellas, I'd really love to shovel garbage for the glory of the collective. I mean, I really, I'm really, there's nothing I won't do for the collective. <laughs> but I really think that I can serve the collective better by banging the drums, <laughs> by blowing the kazoo, which I do, you know, by, uh, by, 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 well, by, by, by acting. Uh, by imitating uh, the, the, the collective president, whoever it is. Right? <laughs> That's my area of expertise. That's my area which I can serve the collective best. Uh, and so it's not that I don't want to shovel garbage. I love to shovel garbage, but I really think I'd serve. <laughs> Who's gonna? Who, what criteria will these guys have to say that I'm wrong or right? In other words, how do they know whether I serve the collective best by 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 putting on a performance, imitating the collective uh, chairman and vice chairman? Uh, or by, you know, by, by, by blowing the kazoo or whatever. There's no criterion. There's no real criterion to figure out anything here. And so the whole, whatever decision they make is going to be arbitrary. If they like me, they'll say, okay, Rothbard, go and blow the kazoo. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't like me, they'll, they'll send me on the, on the garbage shoveling detail. 
Okay, so we get, in other words, to the point, since there's no rational criterion, there's no rational criterion of economic calculation, such as we have under a, in the free market under a price system and a profit and loss test, the criterion is all arbitrary. All right, go out there and we don't like you and you're a trouble. Who are they going to send, for example, to Siberia? Or to, what's the equivalent of Siberia here? Yeah, I don't want to irritate anybody. <laughs> Montana? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Northern Alaska, okay? <laughs> who are we going to send to Alaska? We have to send somebody to Alaska. We want to uh, have a pipeline. Who are we going to send? Who are you going to decide to go to build a pipeline in Alaska? Well, who are they going to send there? They're going to send up, well, uh, Comrade Someone. He's a troublemaker. He's been bellyaching about the collective recently. Let's, let's toughen him up, I think, and <laughs> send him to Northern Alaska. <laughs> and so, in other words, when you get a system of centralized planning, you almost inevitably have a Siberian solution. I mean, in other words, uh, Lenin and Stalin start shipping their their uh, opponents to Siberia, which is uh, you know uh, a non-preferred <laughs> residential area. <laughs> because see, somebody's got to be sent to Siberia. Who are you going to send there? You'll send the guys you want to get rid of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in other words, all bets are off in a socialist system. It's all who you know, who you don't know, who who hates you, who doesn't like you. The whole all of life is politicized, which is really going to really ultimate horror as far as I'm concerned. All of life becomes, everything becomes a political decision. So, uh, the, uh, I got one, one um, example I remember the, uh, about how labor is allocated under socialism. The Cuba, I don't know if you remember, about, I guess about slightly less than 20 years ago, Castro decided they have to have, we have to produce 10 million tons of sugar in Cuba for some obscure reason. 10 million tons is it. He puts out a big 10 million tons campaign. The world will collapse if we have less than 10 million tons. The world will be saved, or Cuba will be saved with 10 million. And so all these, all American pro leftists rush down to Cuba, the so-called Vento Ramos Brigade, to, to, to cut cane. And, and, that we're all, and they, were, they were ardently in favor of the Cuban collective. They're going to cut cane. I knew, some, I knew a couple of these people, and they cut cane. What happened was they, just, they didn't know a damn thing about cane cutting, obviously. They, were, they spent, spent all their lives in New York City. <laughs> just <don't> exactly <laughs> Not exactly a sugar growing area. <laughs> they were chopping each other in the back with machetes. I mean, if, uh, if anything, they were counterproductive. They, the less, you know, less sugar was being grown for their, for their efforts than, than more. Uh, or you have the, um, you know, in, Ch in Maoist China, you have a kill the starling month. Everybody's go out there and kill starling <laughs> month. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> uh, but I know, it's, a, it's a monstrous system. I say it's the only way you can handle it. I mean, how do you how do you allocate labor if you can't have a wage a free wage system? In other words, if you're going to if, if some company wants to build a pipeline now in Alaska, which they did, how, who decides who goes up to Alaska? Well, the way they did it, of course, they they pay very high wages. You make a fortune. If you want to go schlep up to Alaska and work on the pipeline, and a lot of people did it. Okay, and since you, there's nothing to spend on Alaska, you save you save it all up. All right, so that was the free choice of people go up to Alaska, and, and but, but in a in a socialist system or a communist system where free wage, uh, free wage market is not allowed, where everything is supposed to be done by moral incentives, uh, aside from one or two nuts who might really love to go to Alaska and work for the collective, they're shipped out by coercion. In other words, the dissonance, the troublemakers, the guys who are look, looking cross-eyed at you, you might, you might, <laughs> might vote against you in the next cell meeting, he gets shipped out of Alaska. All right. <clears throat> the... Uh, <clears throat> The calculation problem begins in um, in, um, in Russia. Uh, as when, the, when, the, when the communists took over in Russia in, in 1917, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to inaugurate communism. That was the whole point, right? The first thing they did was they tried to abolish money, abolish the market, and have everybody contribute to the common heap, which is what they were advocating for the last the previous 75 years or so. Uh, this was called war communism, as, as Paul Craig Roberts points out in his excellent book, which I recommend to everybody. Uh, the war communism, which lasted from about 1917 to 1920, 21, was not just a war situation. It was a dedicated ideological thing. The communists get in, they finally achieve power. What are they supposed to, they're supposed, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to put into effect their goals, namely, smash the market, smash commodity production and money. Everybody will then contribute to the common heap. Well, the whole thing fell apart. Peasants, weren't getting money, so they didn't, they didn't contribute anything to common heat. 
and it started killing peasants, and the whole thing just broke down. Nobody ate any food. So uh, <clears throat> what then happened was that Lenin, being a very shrewd pragmatist, finally decided it's either communist ideology or else we all get shot. And so he just gave up. He totally retreated, went back to the so-called new economic policy, and NEP, which really reestablished uh, capitalism or semi-capitalism for about for most of the 1920s. And so people started eating again, and then and Russia was saved. <clears throat> Uh, so this this was a, an ideological attempt which which didn't work. Same thing happened in Pol Pot and, and Cambodia. The difference in Cambo and Cambodia. First thing the Cambodian people were there. The Cambodians were well, an interesting group. They were uh, first of all they were all about 14 years old. Or so. Second of all they had just come out of the jungle after about 10, 15 years of fighting in the jungle. So they were sort of isolated from all other uh, influences. A third of all, they all studied in France, which is always a bad thing to begin with. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> they studied under French, Marxist, Maoist, whatever, uh, Marcusian, whatever they are there, Althusserians. And so they decided to crush, not only crush all money, but they abolished money. Okay? Now you might think this is only, so what if money is abolished? After all, it's just materialism. Why should we be so concerned? Why are we pro-money? Economists, have always, free market economists, have always been accused of being materialistic and being pro-money. I'm pro money mostly because I don't have any. But the uh, the point about the money thing is, is there's a direct correlation between money and freedom. See, if you earn money, in other words, if you get ten thousand dollars a year, let's say, from your employer or whoever, and you go out and you spend it on whatever you want, right? And you can buy things, you can not buy things, you can save. You have your freedom to allocate your income. But if there's no money, it means you get you eat or you get whatever is handed out to you by the government authorities, by your cell group or committee or whatever it is. Okay, comrade, three bowls of rice and that's it. There's no way to get around this. You can't buy anything because money's been abolished. It's a diabolic thing. I mean, it's a total, it's probably the worst thing, single thing that can happen to anybody's freedom is for money to be abolished because that's it. Because then you accept whatever you can get from the, from the comrades who are usually pretty short anyway. And if they don't like the cut of your jib or if you look too intellectual to them, you get only half a grain of rice per day or whatever. Right? So... <clears throat> So again, you have a forced labor system coming in almost automatically in Cambodia. The difference with Cambodia, the difference between Cambodia and, and the regular Marxist-Leninist thing is the Cambodians would absorb Rousseau somewhere along the way in France. So you get a weird combination of Lenin and Rousseau. But the idea is that cities are evil. <laughs> to be stamped out. <laughs> uh, immediately, right? So they crushed the city. Of course, everybody started starving very, very quickly. Um, it's, the back, it's sort of like, how should we put it? It's sort of like a like a, a back to, the American back-to-the-land movement going completely berserk, right? <laughs> it's as if the, the back-of-the-land people suddenly appeared with arms and, and machine guns and bazookas and ordered everybody, everybody out of Denver and San Francisco and said, go, go farm <laughs> somewhere. Right? So, uh, <clears throat> anyway, I mean, one thing you have to say about Marx, he did not love the land particularly. So that's one, one thing in his favor. At any rate, the... Uh, on the economic calculation problem, by the way, one interesting parallel that comes, if you live long enough, things sort of go full circle or whatever. Interesting parallels, convolutions come up. Norman Brown, who was one of, one of the most popular writers in the 1960s, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him here, who uh, wrote uh, just saying, a lunatic book called Love Against Death, uh, which is not in paperback, uh, who, who uh, extolled irrationality and unreason. Reason is evil and, and spontaneous, uh, whatever it is, is great. And he finally gets to socialism somewhere in this, in this muck of the book. I mean, it's very... He suddenly talks about this calculation debate on page whatever it is, 202 or something like that. And he says, here's what he says. He says, Mises and Hayek challenge socialism. They pointed out that socialism can't calculate, can't engage in rational economic calculation. And the trouble with socialism in the 20th century is but the longer and learning these people took them at their word and they try to show that socialism can't calculate. And that's where socialism went off, went bad. The glory of socialism is it shouldn't calculate, should, should be totally irrational. <laughs> and <laughs> shouldn't worry about calculation. Everybody, you know, so that's, that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, fortunately, nobody's heard of Brown recently. So I think that's, uh, you know, the world works in wondrous ways. <laughs> We now have a sort of a, a slight reprise of this, and latest very highly touted book by George Gilder, who's a right winger, contrast to Brown being an ultra leftist. <clears throat> Gilder, in his new book, Wealth, Wealth and Poverty, says that uh, 
So the great thing about the free market, as a contrast to the government, is the free market is irrational. <laughs> and we and free market can't calculate, and it's free spontaneous giving and all that stuff. So anyway, I, that's uh, so I just say one of the interesting things about history is you learn that the same error keeps popping up <laughs> over decades and centuries. It gives you an interesting perspective. Um, The uh, what's happened in the I, sh I should wind up this thing by talking about what's happened in, I think favorable and inter interesting favorable thing in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, the what my thing is quite phenomenal what happened in Yugoslavia. I don't think the current Yugoslav system is in any great shakes. But if you look at what Yugoslavia is now compared to what it was in 1952, it's almost phenomenal. Uh, Tito, as we all know, broke with Stalin in 48. <clears throat> That in itself was not that significant from an economic point of view, but in 1952, largely under the guidance, I think, of Milovan Gilos, who later broke with Fido and so forth, um, they suddenly came to the conclusion that central planning isn't working. There's something wrong with it, and they started moving very rapidly toward the market, uh, which is uh, which, uh, really phenomenal. And they've gotten to the point, at this point, I wouldn't say they have a free market, they've gotten to the point, however, where there's it's very strong elements of free market economy here. The workers really own the plant. Uh, it's truly owned in a producer's co-op manner. The individual worker can't sell his share, which is a big defect. But still in all, the, the, the plants are all owned like a producer's co-op by the workers. They, they exchange products freely and with a, and a free price system. The tax rate is pretty low. It's only about 20%, which is a lot lower than the American tax rate. This, this change came in about 19, in the mid-60s. It was previously like 80 or 90%. So, uh, so we have a situation now where, and along with this, came a... Uh, a change of attitude among the Yugoslav communists. Uh, uh, so that they started saying, well, you, get, you have things like this, uh, uh, especially, by the way, in Croatia and Slovenia, where the communist economists are, are almost free market oriented compared to the rest of Yugoslavia. At any rate, um, they say things like this. Why should we productive, thrifty, hardworking people in Croatia be taxed, support lazy Slavs in Montenegro? <laughs> uh, or... <laughs> Why should we keep subsidizing? Why should we keep subsidizing these inefficient factories in Albania and, and the Kosovo, Kosovo region, Albania, Albania type region? Uh, and also, they they, they they think in terms of uh, uh, the Yugoslav mindset. Even the American mindset of something, or at least has been until recently, something like this: if, you have, if, if there's a problem, okay, there's a social problem. There's lots of social problems. Millions, I can find millions of social problems, such as. Too many redheaded people have hangnails. Okay, I mean we could have we could spend ten million dollars on any 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 H grant or NSF grant, and find out how many old people have hangnails, redheaded old people have hangnails, and count it up. They have hangnails. We've got to do the hangnail gap with the hangnail problem. We need a crash program. Ten billion dollars in federal aid to eliminate hangnails from the face of the earth. Okay, uh, that's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the that's the typical has been the typical Western American mindset. If there's a problem, pass a law, get a federal uh, grant. If a if a law creates new problems, such as if you have price control, you have shortages, what do you do then? Well, you create a Gestapo to root out the hoarded oil or whatever it is. In other words, you create new laws, new bureaucracies on top of it. The Yugoslav mindset got to be at a point like this. Well. Uh, if they have, ran into problems, they did and still do, what government intervention can we repeal? Where can we introduce the market to fix this up? And this is the kind of mindset I'd like to see us develop. In other words, if we have any problem, okay, what are we repealing next? Where is the government messing things up and where can we get rid of it? See, that's the kind of mindset which I think we can, that, that, just that mindset we can learn from the Yugoslavia. They haven't gone far enough, obviously, in Yugoslavia, but that, that mindset they interestingly adopted. In the late 60s, they were talking about early 70s, before Tito went a little bit off the rails, which I think he did, they started talking in these terms. They said, well, you know, the workers own the plants, okay, but each individual worker can't own his share. In other words, how, isn't it, isn't it uh, unfortunate if a worker retires at the age of 65 or something, why shouldn't he be able to keep voting? Why shouldn't he be able to pass his share on to his children? And they started talking in terms of a stock market. Uh, and if we, if we ever get a stock market new stock, we can say that you know, the millennium has arrived, free market. <laughs> they started talking in terms of a stock market, which of course is, would send any true Marxist spinning in his grave or cutting his throat. 
And they said, well, let's, let's, we know that the old-fashioned Marxists won't like this, the idea of a stock market. Let's call it socialist people capitalism. <laughs> 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 so that's the, uh, that's the kind of creative thinking I think it's, uh, I think, find of interest in the... Uh, at any rate, um, there's one joke, by the way, that among economists, I don't know if it's still true, but the joke used to be going around that in any international economic meeting, the Eastern economists, I mean, the communist country economists, would, would talk about the glories of the free market, and the Western economists would talk, economists would talk about the glories of planning. <laughs> uh, maybe this is <laughs> maybe this is a change at this point. At any rate, uh, <clears throat> the um, I think um, <clears throat> I think we, one of the things we need in the in the in the economics profession, the, the, the Mises Hayek side of the economic calculation debate is still not very well known for some obscure reason, even among free market economists, even among people who are opposed to socialism. Their view is that the only problem with socialism, Frank Knight, for example, is an excellent free market economist in many ways. His view was that the only problem with socialism is moral and the incentive problem, etc. There's no problem with calculation. I think if we realized there was a calculation problem, it would, it would provide a tremendous new insight and new ammunition just, just on that basis uh, and a critique of socialism. It's pretty clear, aside from the moral aspects, which I don't deny, I mean, I think moral aspects are very important. If you also come to the conclusion that socialists can't even calculate what they want to do, in other words, even if you have a socialist planner, even if you assume that he can override consumer sovereignty, if he allocate labor any place he wants, they still can't do what he wants, this, I think, is a powerful argument against the socialist position. And it's an argument, as I say, which I think has been uh, carried, borne out in practice in all the socialist countries that, that we know about. And it was all, that, the, all those from early Virginia and Plymouth Rock communism to Pol Pot. It's all been a very a similar record, some, of course, more brutal than others, but a very similar record of total and abject failure. And um, I think the failure is systematic. It's not just an accident that every socialist experiment has failed miserably. It's inherent in the nature of the socialist system. Okay, I think that's... Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Rothbard would be glad to answer any questions. Uh, I think I'll start out with uh, Professor Bolding. You got a question? <laughs> or a comment? <laughs> I see you have your Adam Smith tie on, which is very good. There are, there are four Adam Smith ties here tonight. Murray isn't wearing one because they don't make them they in bow ties. Them. That's right. They don't make them. Right. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Now the society can exist unless the market is open. <coughs> Both are very good. and the tax system by public goods and what I know of grants are going And the, while I agree that the, um, the, the hatred of the market is uh, irrational, it's very useful, it's very useful work. Mm. This is a good deal to talk about the problem of the world. See, the capitalism is profoundly more than how to get people to love it. Well, no, I love it. <laughs> 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 I think, uh, I, I, there, I love the language. Yeah. I mean, I like it. Yeah. How do you have it? There are, there is the problem that the social connection. Mm. The market system which permits it to function without its own control. So the market has the policy system that it has. Everything is going wrong. Well, the Great Depression is a great example. No, no, I don't think so. I think Great Depression was caused by government, a Federal Reserve intervention, and Hoover's intervention. That's a, I can't get off on that because it's another topic. I'm happy to lecture on that some other time. But that's a, that's a, yeah, well, that's the. I don't think. Uh, <laughs> Any such thing exists in extreme cases. That is, the market is a system that takes away the social rights of the kind of banking government. In that kind of thing, it can go to the 
Well, I think I think there. I agree with you in this sense. There are obviously in the real world there is a whole spectrum of cases, and you know you have semi-socialists. I'm not. I don't deny that. Obviously, uh, I think pure pure market economies have existed in the past, but at any rate, and certainly approximations to them. Uh, I just think the more market you have, the better it is, and the more government you have, the worse. And so when you get to the point of socialism, obviously you have an ex you have an extreme position. I don't see any any real market failure though. I think. Uh, I really think that all the economic ills we can think of are caused by uh, by government. I mean, first, I mean, initially, of course, they're caused by the fact we all are born in a world without capital equipment and all that. Apart from that, they're caused by government. Uh, so that, but that's a whole gets us in a whole other. Hong Kong is the ideal society. Beg pardon? Hong Kong is the ideal society. Yeah. Because it doesn't have neighbors, friends of government. Yeah. Well, that's all we need. That's yeah. Yeah, Hong Kong is great. Hong Kong is getting slipping a little bit since that guy died. I, I mean, resigned. I forget his name. Who was responsible for that? Uh, because now they're slipping and they have a little bit control and stuff. But that's uh... Hong Kong. By the way, it's an interesting point because Hong Kong. When I was growing up, uh, was the textbooks all said that uh, America is strong and great and prosperous because we have a lot of large natural natural resources and uh, big land area. And a lot of uh, wheat and you know that sort of thing, agriculture and all that, and, and, and warm water, whatever. Hong Kong is practically nothing; has no resources. Uh, just has a crummy rock. <laughs> Doesn't grow anything except you know, a little bit out, up up on the, on the peninsula there. And uh, there's a huge number of people. I mean, so and any criteria you think of, it'd be an overpopulated area, and yet it's of course flourishing and standard living is going up, etc. It's all due, due to freedom. Somebody, you should take the. I don't want to be favorite. Use the favoritism. Go ahead. Oh, okay, up there. Uh, when uh, Professor Blaney introduced you, he did not mention uh, your work, America's Great Depression, mm. uh, which is a favorite of mine. I find that he going back to uh, 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 the economic mm. depression now. Uh, do you see any new factors or new uh, grounds that we should? Well, I don't think we have a 1929 situation because we're <clears throat> no longer any checks or limits on the Federal Reserve System money expansion. I mean, those days there were. There was the gold standard. There was various other checks. Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve itself could have gone bankrupt, for example. Uh, now we have a uh, deposit, bank deposit insurance, and we have no ghost check whatsoever, either domestic or, or, or international. And there's no statutory limits. The Federal Reserve can, uh, can theoretically, theoretically print you know, unlimited amounts of money. So the sky is now the limit. Uh, so I don't think we'll ever get a 1929 type depression, say, because, yeah, I think it'd be much worse. I think the, the, the unfortunate progn uh, eventual prognosis would be hyper runaway inflation. Uh, I, I don't think we have to get there if we have the will. In other words, we rise up and say stop somewhere or another, but, uh, but uh, that would be the eventual course. The trouble is most of my Austrian colleagues or hard money colleagues, when they come to this conclusion, they get a little hopped up about it. They get so enamored of this analysis. They say in six months we're going to have runaway inflation. Well, it doesn't work that fast. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slow, cumulative pro process which then finally reaches a critical mass and then goes off. So it takes a long time, but we'll know it when we get, get to it. The critical point, by the way, um, the critical point comes when the, for example, um, in 1923, when the runaway inflation was just beginning to take hold in Germany, <clears throat> what happens is prices begin to go up much faster than the money supply. The, the increase in money supply is the major core. I can't, again, I can't go into the point out why this is true. The, the increase in money supply is the cause of increasing prices. What happens is after Inflation has proceeded for many years. People, inflationary expectations then take over, and people don't spend money as fast as they can. They know damn well the prices will be 20% more next week, right? And so, but at that point, people experience what they call a shortage of money, what we now call a liquidity crunch, or whatever you want to call it. I haven't got enough money to pay for the high prices. They then call upon the government, the central bank, to supply them with the money, okay? In 1923, Rudolf Havenstein, the head of the central Reichsbank, made a famous speech which he said, don't worry, folks. He said, of course, in much more pedantic German than I'm saying here. <laughs> don't worry, folks. We, we realize you're suffering from money shortage. We will print unlimited amounts of money until you can catch up. <laughs> until, <laughs> until, until money supply catches up with prices. Of course, the result was history. I mean, bingo. Two trillion marks to buy a stick of bubble gum. Right? So, 
Now, that, you think this is crazy. I mean, when I tell this to my students, they, they, they laugh in superior fashion. Of course, we never say that now. In 1973 or 74, I guess it was, when we had our first double digit in, peacetime double-digit inflation under Nixon, Walter Heller, distinguished former chairman of Council of Economic Advisors, wrote an article in the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia Quarterly Review in which he said as follows. Money supply can't be the cause of higher prices because it's prices are going up faster in the last year or so than money supply. Therefore, as a matter of fact, the Federal Reserve has a responsibility to keep pumping more money until, until real cash balances catch up to the status quo. Which means, just saying in more sophisticated economic jargon what Chavistein said before. Now, if Heller had been running the economy, we might have, uh, we might have the uh, hyperinflation right now. Fortunately, he wasn't. Fortunately, he was a harmless professor at the University of Minnesota. <laughs> But I mean, it's, it's, it can get that close, you see, when people start thinking in that, in that kind of terms. Yeah. Now you start out by telling how the uh, post office has gone down and down and down to period of quality. Um, I think it'd be interesting to find out what made the post office work so well in the first place, which is what been doing went down so far. But uh, that's kind of facetious. But, uh, you said that you would think the more uh, capitalism the better, which you can't literally mean because if you meant that, that would mean no government at all. That's right. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I would make the qualification of what you mean by government. I don't want to be uh, picky about this. Well, I had a question to ask if you would just allow. No, no, but I mean, I'm, I just want. No, no, but no, no. I mean, by by government, I define government as being a, a tax authority, which acquires its revenue by means of coercion by taxes. Okay. Uh, I don't by government. I don't mean police, police agencies, guards, Pinkertons, courts, things like that, because that because they can be obviously run and have been on a private basis. By government, in other words, I mean a tax coerced organization. Okay, I just want to be quite clear. I'm not. It's not that I'm against. I, I don't understand what you're saying. Okay. Well, all right. Look. What, what government is permissible in your view? Uh, well, I, I, it depends how you define government. I define government. Define. Huh? Define. I define government as, as an institution which acquires its revenue by by uh, by theft, by by coercion. Okay? The only institution in society except the mafia, okay, which which is not a respectable, legitimate institution. Okay? <laughs> Everybody else acquires their income either by sale of product or service or by monetary contributions from members okay, or donors. Only the government, the government, the government's the only institution in society, of all the numerous institutions we have, political, social, whatever, the only institution acquires its revenue by getting, going out there and forcing you to pay up. If you don't pay up, you go to jail. There should be no tax. That's right. Okay, so I mean, that would be a clear... It's not that I'm opposed, for example, to carrying the mail or fighting fire or all that. I think they can be done much better and more morally on a private base, market basis. I'm in favor of everything being marketable. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, they had they had right. They had private plots of land until I think late 1950s, which was the great great proletariat. What was greatly forward? Before that, it was it was really a semi-socialist economy in any in a technical sense. And they had lots of private. Merchants, private plots of land, and all that. There's only a great leap forward. Mao's decided to crush everything and collectivize. Okay, and every you remember every farm had to have its own steel plant. <laughs> well, that that was a total collapse. But at any rate, and then came of course the great proletarian cultural revolution, which was even more messy. So what they're getting back to essentially is the is the pre great great culture, great leap forward kind of system. They haven't done it yet, but they're planning presumably on the on the path of getting back to a semi market. Now, how much how much will be? I don't know. Certainly, their, their, their doctrines now are, are, are pretty good from that point of view. In other words, capitalism, that's what happens in capitalism, from each according to his ability to each according to his ability. That's, that's what happens on the market. So um, I don't know how far they'll get, because if you, if you allow that one central elite to run everything, obviously they can, make, uh, they can go off again. They can decide next year, well, you know, the other, uh, Menem Chang was really a great, uh, Menem Mao was really great, Chung Ching was really great, and then she's back again and crushes everybody. So you can't trust them. 
But certainly the course they're on now is infinitely better than they were before, you know, two years ago. It's really sort of a heroic thing, if, considering Deng Xiaoping, the current chairman, has totally reversed the Chinese system from a total slave state to an only partial slave state, with, with, with parts of market in there, which is I mean, a big change. You look at an historical process, it was kind of a heroic act. It was also a heroic act of Mao to try to crush everything, and it was totally nutty and crazy. <laughs> Sometimes heroism sort of slides over to being nuts. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's not a good consumer goods are good. Right. We decided that consumer goods are good. In fact, matter of fact, they wrote an article a couple of years ago after Deng Xiaoping came in that. Uh, what we really like to have is sort of this sort of society, and they spell it out. It sounds like New York in 1970 or something like that. Was that what, <laughs> so, so in other words, they really changed their philosophic orientation tremendously. And obviously, the social pattern hasn't changed that much, but <clears throat> the, um, the direction, of course, is much better. Uh, I don't know if Shirley MacLaine will go out there and love them again like she loved the Mao people. <laughs> so that's a, And what? Yeah. Well, a lot of, uh, I, don't, I don't know, a lot of the, in, mo in most of these communist countries, there's this enormous black market. You have to realize statistics are, are shaky because, uh, I mean, I understand that Russia, for example, would not really operate without a black market. What happens is the managers have to fill their quotas. <coughs> My guy, I haven't filled my quota. I've got 60 days to go. I'm way behind. A, a heroic entrepreneur pops up. Tovarish, you want to fulfill your quota? I've got 30 good men here. We'll work you know, 50 hours a week to fulfill your quota. All you, have to do is, all you have to do is to pay me 100,000 rubles out of the till. Thank God, or thanks Brezhnev or whatever. He takes the, <laughs> takes the 100,000 out. He pays them, and that's it. It's all under the table. It's all very illegal, but, the, but it's done all the time. It's called blot. Uh, I can't pronounce Russian, but that's, it's that, uh, and so the whole system is rife with black market, and um, and uh, that, that's say it's the only way they can really accomplish anything. I can say, but I mean, the, the, the Yugoslavia too, by the way, the philosophic when they started shifting the economic picture, they started saying philosophically the individual is more important than the collective. They say things like that, which is total heresy from the communist point of view. So that's very interesting. I, mean, it's a, I think, see, I think it's an aspiring development. One of the problems I find with conservatives in general is that when a country goes communist, they figure that's it. The iron door is closed, and if they're ruined forevermore, we may as well nuke them because it's, it's all hopeless. <laughs> it's not true because so, since socialism falls apart and doesn't work, and since it, it goes against the human spirit, uh, I'm very optimistic that the freedom will pop up, and I think it has in these countries. It's the, the direction starts changing rapidly again. Yeah. Well, the Polish disease is a general term for socialist uh, planning, failure of socialist planning, and failure to allocate labor. Right? I mean, it's, uh, what are they going to do with the workers? See, the Polish disease is a general is a general problem. <clears throat> what do you do with government unions of government employees? If you have a union in a, in a private company. If the union demands a 20% wage increase, the private company says, well, gee, we can't do that because it'll bankrupt us. You can only get 10%, and they agree on 12 or something. Right? But in the government situation, when the taxpayer pays, how do you know how much to pay the, a, a co-worker or whatever? There's really no criterion. And so, uh, I mean, how do you know how much to pay the Polish miners or whoever? So, uh, how do you know how much to pay... Uh, you know, some, some clerk in the, in, the, in the civil service in Washington. There's no real, and cer certainly in a socialist country, there's no market uh, guide. It's all arbitrary. So in a sense, they have an insoluble problem in Russia. They can't, there's, no way to, there's no way to combat unionism in, in a socialist country. Interestingly enough, even though it's supposed to be the vanguard, the company is supposed to be the vanguard of the working class, you know, the government's supposed to be handling everything and paying out money and getting production. How do you, how do you deal with a union? What's there to bargain about? It's all, you know, thin air, hot air. There's no, there's no profit, there's no loss. You can't say, well, people lose money. Well, nobody loses money. It's all, it's all very vague. And, huh? Well, I don't know. It's a big mess. I'm not really uh, an expert on the Polish economy per se. What I meant by the Polish disease is sort of a general problem of socialism. So I really have to defer to somebody else on that. Yeah. What do you do about public goods such as national banks where everybody benefits and nobody wants to pay? 
Uh, I don't want to get into the entire national defense problem now, as you, as you can imagine, it's fairly complex. But I don't, I don't think there are such things as public goods, ever. First place, uh, supposing I'm a pacifist. And I know some of my best friends are pacifists. And uh, to a pacifist who thinks all violence is evil, it's not a public good, it's a public bad, it's a public evil. He's being taxed to increase what he thinks is evil and destructive and death dealing. So, and if you have at least one pacifist in any country, I think we can indicate at least one pacifist in the United States, then the whole thing gets shot. And you're out. Yeah, up there. Uh, you used the term a couple of times, uh, the black market, right. like the uh, kind of color of sinister. No, no, no. I, I love black markets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love black markets. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just using a common term. I mean, it's, it's one of the, it's the problem of communication. If I talk about white market, nobody knows what I was talking about. <laughs> no, no, I think black markets are great. They are, the, the black markets are the market popping up under terrible, suppressed, con oppressive conditions, the market pops up again, valiantly. No, I, I, I think it's great. Yeah. What do you think about what was called a few years ago the energy crisis? I'm sure you're tired of all the world. What do you think about that as a microcosm, a government causing? It's terrific. It's great microcosm. Because it's an area where every single facet, I could spend a whole lecture on that very easily, every single facet of the so-called energy crisis was created by the government. Every one. 99% by the American government, and about 1% by the Arab governments. Okay? And it's all, it's all a product of government intervention. There is no energy shortage, it's all nonsense, it's all government. It's total, it's unbelievable mess. I mean, it's just unbelievable. You just, you just go on and on. It's sort of like talking about an Alice in Wonderland picture, like a parody of, 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 of government planning. And so it's, it's yeah, I think, and by the way, the phrase, the moral equivalent of war, of war is pure evil. Next time you hear a politician say it, head for the bunker, because <laughs> when they talk about moral equivalent of war, they mean exactly what they say. They mean totalitarian, you know, high taxes, regulations, and all that sort of stuff. They mean things like, uh, <clears throat> I mean, for example, just by the way, in the energy crisis, I may as well get this off my chest, because no, not too many people have really bellyached about this. They talk about price control on oil and natural gas. One of the things which really sends me up the wall, because I'm a great fan of, uh, I hate heat, okay? I'm a great fan of cool weather. One of the things that sent me up the wall is, the, is, the, is Jimmy Carter's total smashing of air conditioning in this country. <laughs> when, he, when he said air conditioning may not go above, uh, may not go below 78 degrees, which is, of course, nothing. It's like, you know, it's, it's, you may as well not have it at all. I think he was successful in that. I think he really... Because I crossed the country last summer, even in Nevada, even the casinos in Nevada were hot. I mean, it's, it's really it's going pretty far. So he was successful in crushing air conditioning. I mean, it's, it's just, it's just pure totalitarian. The idea is to make everybody feel the sacri to sacrifice, <laughs> feel the pain. And by the way, the Jimmy Carter, uh, I, there was one constant leitmotif of Jimmy Carter's administration, which started in his, in his acceptance speech and continued on through the energy talk you're talking about ever since. It's one of my favorite topics. The, 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 <laughs> the theme, the leitmotif, which, by the way, is philosophically incorrect, to say the least, but very kindly. I feel your pain. Remember that? He said that. He said that. <laughs> I love each and every one of you, and I feel your pain. <laughs> he, he said that in his acceptance speech. <laughs> when he said that, I was ready to punch this TV screen in. Right? <laughs> Obviously, he doesn't feel my pain. What is he talking about? And he kept saying, he said that in the energy speech and all over, and what he, of course, really meant was, since he obviously got his jolly by, by us feeling pain, <laughs> is to inflict pain on us so we can feel it, so he can feel it. Anyway, that was, uh, I'm glad I got that off my chest. Yeah, that's right there. Right. No, 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 hold it, look, look. <laughs> San Francisco has a private police department or the section, which works very well. <clears throat> it's paid by private people in the neighborhood, right? They pay for the route, so somebody patrols your neighborhood. And even in New York, which is demoralized at this point, 
we had, there are blocks in New York and Manhattan which hire their own private policemen because there's mugging constantly. So they have this private cop there. He doesn't, he's not allowed to carry a gun because of the stupid government regulation, but he's at least there under the booth. And so this reduces crime almost to zero on that street. Okay? So when I'm, I'm talking about people will pay for services, means they'll pay to, be, to defend themselves. Uh, they will not pay to be beaten up because they're carrying pot. Okay? <laughs> That's obviously not going to pay for that. They will pay for services, not for being oppressed. Now, in the case of traffic situations, that's an entirely different situation. Traffic, traffic is not a really police function. You don't have to have cops in the, uh, running traffic. You can have meter maids and all that because uh, traffic regulations are made and have to be made by whoever owns the roads, right? If you have a government on the roads, you have to have a government, some, somebody in the government, some traffic officer making sure there's no tie-up and all that. And everybody you know, crosses a green and right. That's perfectly legitimate. That's part of the road owning function. There are places in the United States which have private roads, like shopping centers and things like that, or, or private islands. There and there, you have private guards who, who run the roads and make sure this happens. So the who, the the road that's part of the road owning function. Unfortunately, in the United States, most roads are owned by government. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah? When you have private roads or private highways, then you'll have private guards or whatever you want to call them, traffic officers, perform that function. Yeah. <laughs> Where's what? Where it's grown by the I think there's good news and there's bad news about the Libertarian Party. <laughs> the, uh, the good news is that we've grown a lot. We, the ideas are being spread quite a bit. Uh, ideas such as I've been emitting tonight. Uh, you see them in places you didn't see before. Uh, Thirty years ago, I, was, I said these same sort of things. I was called either a fascist or a Neanderthal or crazy, or all well, three. And now the usual reaction is, well, gee, I agree with a lot of it, but I don't think it's really practical. That's a big step forward from the previous reaction. Uh, so um, on the other hand, we have certain problems in the party, uh, in the movement of the party. We have a uh, certain deficiency in knowledge. Uh, a certain lack of uh, reading and things like that. The sort of thing which afflicts, afflicts a general educational <laughs> system in the United States. <laughs> afflicts the Libertarian Party, certain, uh, certain inattention to ideas and, and, and books and things like that. Uh, and if you do that, you can easily get off the track. For example, one powerful person in one powerful state party just said, let's have, why don't we have temporary rent control? Okay. Now this is that it's that sort of thing. From if you if you have you're not you don't have a firm grip on the principle, it's easy to sort of slide off. Especially especially you see the sugar plum fairies of of a lot of votes and a lot of money and things coming in. So that's something has to be guarded against. But as Jefferson said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Right. So I'm trying to be eternally vigilant. Okay. Oh, uh, I, <clears throat> I, mean, I, I thought I they said the major problem was not they were not willing to work for the common good. I don't think they were. But even if they were, it wouldn't solve the socialist problem. They, they have no way of calculating, no way of telling them what to do. I mean, you see, when you're talking about helping the poor, solving minor or marginal problem, that's something else. I'm talking now about the general social uh, institution, so, uh, economic system, where you're you don't know what to do, but you're told go out and work for the collective. Who's gonna? How do you know how to work for the collective? What are you supposed to do about it, right? He's supposed to spend all the time helping the blind. He's supposed to work on produce steel. And what are you supposed to do? See? And if the market doesn't tell you what to do, so to speak, then some committee, some arbitrary totalitarian committee is going to tell you what to do, and they, they don't know what to do either. That's what, essentially what I said. And as far as um, things like special problems in the market, the market solves them much more, much more readily than any kind of government. First place, the market creates a much more productive system. Standard of living goes way up. If you have a generally affluent society, as we basically have in the United States today, it's much easier to solve problems of poverty or handicap or something than if you're back in 1500 and everybody's starving. If everybody's starving, there's not, mo there's not much surplus left over to help blind people or anything else. So the more affluent society is, the much more likely you'll have to have these problems uh, solved. Also, private groups are much, more, much better at this than government, to say the least. Government welfare is set up on the basis... First of all, government has unlimited funds. I mean, they get funds from the taxpayer. Okay? 
So the government social worker's position is they essentially want to maximize their own income and, and power. And so they go out there, they want, to, they want to keep, they want to find clients, so go and keep them there, so, that, so they keep their income and, and, and power up. Uh, and so you have a situation where welfare people are sort of sucked into the system and kept there in order to, in order to, in order to give power and income to the, to the social workers, or the anti-poverty workers, whatever you want to call them. Whereas the private charity system tries to get these people to help themselves as quickly as possible, get them on their feet, and out of this thing as quickly as possible, which was the pre-1933 system, basically. Yeah. Uh, I have a rather philosophical question. I've lived 17 years in this country, so I must completely agree that 99% of people hate the system. Mm. Now, I have to bet I came to England, I lived there for 10 years, I've been here for 4 years now, and I was absolutely terrified how much support I found for socialism in England and even in here. And the question is, why is it that people are attracted to the doctrine? I think they stupid or It's a very interesting question. Uh, <laughs> well, Lysander Spooner said there are several classes of people who, 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 are, who support the state. They're the knaves who, who get money and power out of it, the ruling class, we call it. And they're the dupes. We're sucked into this, or we're, we're fooled into thinking this is really a great system. Uh, and then, of course, there's a third minority, a third group of people who know what's going on are too cowardly to say anything about it. It sort of takes care of the majority, most of the population. Uh, now, specifically, I don't, I'm not sure what motivates them. I mean, who, who knows what motivates other people? It's a very chancy kind of uh, analysis. But uh, uh, I think some of it, obviously, some of it is error, and, and uh, others, other, others of it is deliberate. Uh, I can't imagine, I mean, for example, let me just give an instance, go back to John Kenneth Galbraith. John Kenneth Galbraith has made a literal fortune, millions of millions of dollars, made a career and a fortune out of denouncing affluence. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> the guy has got, <laughs> it's true, the guy's got mansions in three or four countries, he, go, he, he skis at Gestad, you know, for three months every year. He's done it out of attacking affluence. Now, I can't believe this is only honest error. I just can't believe it. <laughs> so you have, in other words, a conscious ruling class who's raking in the shekel. One of the things, I'm trying to write a book on the progressive period, which is the, the origins of statism in this country, basically, 1900 to 1920. I mean, one of the interesting things about this period, one, one of the origins, you sort of see the thing happening in embryo, all the, thing, all the evil things starting at that point. And one of the interesting things is the science of public relations haven't, hadn't really been invented yet. These people were pretty out front in what they, was, what they wanted to do. Say. They were pretty honest and candid. For example, if somebody would be the president of the American Society of Civil Engineers, and he'd say, we are civil engineers, this is a complex economy, therefore we should run the society. We should have power. And the physicians said that, and psychiatrists said that. Everybody's out to grab power and wealth, and they were pretty honest about it. <clears throat> so nowadays, of course, you don't say things like that because your PR person in the plane says that's a no-no. <laughs> But I think that the thing is a lot involved in that. Like the pov it was said that the Lyndon Johnson's war against poverty, the only poverty he relieved was the, war was the poverty of the anti-poverty social workers. Right? We got a huge amount of grants and God knows what, like jobs, grants, and the whole thing flowing in the, into their coffers. And so uh, I think uh, I think it's pretty clear. I'm, I'm, I've, there are obviously a lot of misguided idealists who are going to take the wrong path. No question about that. We shouldn't overlook... One of my criticisms of Hayek, for example, in his great book, The Road to Serfdom, he starts off by saying that, uh, he really starts off by saying, well, socialists are all just, they're great people, but they're engaged in this error. And it's too bad they have this error, and he's trying to convert all of them. I don't think that's really the whole story. It's not just pure error. So uh, I think he now admits that. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking with that question, I think you just answered it. Isn't it possible that at least many Americans seem to be sympathetic they don't really understand Marx. Mm -hmm. They're caught up in the idealism without, mm -hmm. or the so-called idealism without knowing what's involved. Mm -hmm. And very often they're intellectual, but they're looking mm -hmm. at within the context of democracy, they're just ignorant. Mm -hmm. of well, there's a certain amount of real logic also, of course, involved. Uh, there's, there, for example, there's, I mean, and I like to think that both conservatives and liberals want to put people in a cage with different kinds of cages. In other words, uh, uh, liberals want to outlaw tobacco smoking, conservatives want to outlaw pot smoking. Uh, and that really doesn't make much difference. I mean, there's a whole set of cages 
that each one wants to wants to put people in, and really the and really the the logical conclusion is that of all this stuff you have to outlaw eating of sugar and all that sort of the real the real conclusion of all this stuff is everybody should be put in a cage and dole out the proper balanced diet of vitamins and yogurt and whatever and whatever the other whatever each group wants to dole out to them because that's better for them even if it is better for them which is a dubious question people have the right to, to, you know, to pursue their own life run their own life I mean, whether they do well or badly at it that's, that's the basic libertarian position and once you get the idea that you know best not only know better than the other guy but also have the right to tell them what to do then you're in big trouble. Because then each group will then say, yeah, this guy should bow to Mecca three times a day, and we have like a two million man to stop out to see that he does it. So uh, that's another thing. It's the drive for power over other people. Right. Yeah. How can you expect the Well, the market is not really impersonal. The market, what the market really is, is in addition to being free, is really, it's a tremendous and very efficient and very and excellent information spreading device. So people know what's going on uh, much more than any other kind of system. Uh, not just the press, but also the price system and all that sort of stuff. So what you have is a lot of information being beamed at you. This information is not impersonal. There are people on the market. There's nothing on the market which says that you and I can't get together and form a society for the, to aid blind people. As a matter of fact, it's being done all the time. And this is what would happen. That did happen before and will happen even more now. The point is that, and the, and the market provides the affluence and the information to make it much easier to do that. No, 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 it's not a carry. I mean, look, the point is, presumably there's a charitable impulse in most people. Most people express the same sort of sentiment you do. And, it has, and if you look at past history before the New Deal, before government relief came in, there was lots of private uh, charity and relief, etc. The point is that as, uh, as, as the affluence becomes greater under a free market system, this prov provides more room for this kind of uh, behavior, for activity. And also, you don't tax away everybody's income so they can do that. Yeah. So I, there's no absolute guarantees, but uh, it certainly uh, it seems, it seems very plausible that would happen. Because it's, it's, it's always been happening in every other country that can, can do it. Huh? Any country that has... I mean, the Red Cross and the community chess, my God, I mean, go down a whole list. I mean, American Cancer Society, not that I think they're so great, but the point is there's a whole group, fantastic number of private uh, welfare agencies. And, and other countries would be England and, and uh, Western Europe in particular. And those countries which are more affluent, not much private welfare agencies going, down, going on in Zambia, because Zambia, everybody's sort of scrambling along trying to survive. Okay? The more affluent the country, the more it tends to be private welfare agencies. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> right. They, okay. They don't have to look at anything. They forget all this. They could just stop buying assets. It's very simple. They tell the Federal Reserve, give them an comm absolute commandment, right? Don't buy any more assets. That's it. You don't have to look at anything. You don't have to worry about M1, M3, and all the rest of it. Just don't buy any more assets. Just get out of get get out of our lives. That's all they have to do. I mean, eventually I think they should be abolished. But I mean, it's a short-term, immediate solution. Just tell them, don't pass a law. Give, <laughs> give them an order. Don't buy any more assets. Don't buy any more government securities. Don't buy any more uh, bank advances and loans. And they said, just get out. Just shut up and get out and leave and um, <laughs> <that's it. laughs> I know you were a little bit unfair to George Gilder who caused me to burn my pen staple button. I wonder if you would give it is your critique of supply side economics. Oh wow. All right. Uh, in the first place, supply I'm, I'm, I was just thinking about it on the plane coming over. Supply side economics is a very peculiar rubric. It's, it's sort of a portmanteau term. Okay, so it's applied to almost anything. In the very broad sense, supply side economics means being concerned with increasing production, okay, or concerned with the supply side of the economy, the 
with production rather than demand or money or fiscal policy. Well, in that sense, I mean, a lot of left-wing supply-siders, the the income policy types like Mary Bosworth. Supply-side means we have to have an income policy to have wage price control and force these people, blah, blah, blah. There's also the guys who want to have $200 billion subsidies to this this industry and that industry. That's also supply-side. So these guys, of course, are outside the pale. I mean, but they're they're all they're around everywhere. It's it's very confusing. The term supply side covers all these people. Uh, reindustrialization. We do it by having government subsidies and planning. And we think we sit here in Washington. We think that the sin fuel program should go, and the other program shouldn't, and Chrysler should, you know, the big bailout, whatever it is. So we we ignore that. But I just want to say that's a big thing in the supply side field. Okay? It's sort of a fashionable term now. Everybody rushes into it. Okay, now the, the narrow supply side, I suppose, is the, is the uh, Laffer curve, okay. uh, a concept that a, a, a big tax cut will uh, increase government revenue proportionally, so that even more, so that, uh, because it will free the economy and, 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 and increase saving and, and, and work and so forth and so on, so that you, you wind up with even greater total revenue than you have before. The Laffer curve is essentially the way out. It was the Tanstoffel way out. It was the way by which the Republican candidates last election could could square the circle. Right? Because because the thing that always impressed me is Mary McGrew. I don't I don't watch. I hate to watch politicians ever, but I happen to watch the, the Iowa debates. If you remember them, the eight guys or whatever it is, Republican candidates. Mary McGrew gets up and an excellent. She gives an excellent question. She says, "Mr. Bush, or whoever she addressed it to, and to everybody." Um, you're all promising the following things. A big tax cut, right? Uh, balanced budget, right? And keeping the same level of government services, right? Sounds like a contradiction to me. How are you going to do all this? Aha, uh-huh. and they all brought in the Laffer curve. They didn't mention Laffer, of course. But they said, well, you see, if you t- cut tax rates, the revenue would be so great, it will you know, wash all of that. Now, first place, uh, there's no evidence for this, all right? I mean, I'm not saying it's inconceivable that would happen. There's no evidence for it whatsoever. I don't think it would really happen. I think, see, that so far, some smart leftist economists, who don't seem to exist anymore, but some smart leftist economists, <laughs> you know, the way he, could, he or she could rebut the Laffer curve would be as follows. Okay, let's test the Laffer curve, fella. Let's do it the other way around. Let's raise income taxes by 20% and see if revenue falls off. I'll bet your bottom dollar that wouldn't fall off. Okay? But see, that's, that's the way they could, they could outfox Laffer. They haven't done it yet. <clears throat> but... I don't want to, I shouldn't really publicize because somebody's going to take that. That's right. Now, I personally am in favor of any tax cut any time, anywhere, right? I'm in favor of cutting marginal taxes, total taxes, <laughs> depreciation allowances, anything of any size. So I'm sympathizing with laughing people in that respect. Am I in favor of cutting taxes regardless of what happens to the budget? On the other hand, because I'm, for one thing, even if there's a big, bigger deficit, which I think there would be, why should a tax be better than a deficit? I mean, tax is pure evil, a deficit is just half evil. Okay? In other words, uh, at least if you, if you have a de- even if the deficit are inflationary, right? at least, if, even if, you're, if, you're, if your Wonder Bread would now cost $2 a loaf instead of 70 cents a loaf because of the deficit, at least you're still getting Wonder Bread. The taxes, you're getting nothing except heartache. Okay? So in other words, the tax is the worst possible thing. On the other hand, I think that the Laffer curve is pure demagogy. I think they know it. I think these people really know it. I really do. I think, they, I think it's pure political demagogy. <clears throat> and uh, so, because I've asked, I asked Laffer, I met him in Chicago, and I asked him, well, look, supposing it doesn't work, supposing you're on the other side of the Laffer curve. So, and also, you know, there's no time dimension in the Laffer curve. In other words, he really says it's instantaneous. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be instant. You can't gear up and produce twice as much in two, in two weeks. Maybe you work in five years. No, it's supposed to be instantaneous. So I asked him that, and this is the position Irving Crystal takes as sort of the guru, the political philosophy guru of the supply of Laffer people. And they both have really the same answer. They really say it's all demagogy. In other words, they really say what Laffer really said was, look, by the time they get the tax cut, they'll, they'll love it so much they wouldn't care about the, 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 the deficit, <laughs> about the revenue and all that. Right? That's really what it amounts to. It's all a shock. It's a scam. <laughs> the whole thing is a scam. And I don't, and even though in a sense I'm sympathetic because I like to see taxes cut anyway, it really redounds against you. I don't want to be, you know, a, a sort of a cliche preacher here, but then, you know, some people might remember it. <laughs> Public memory might be short. I <laughs> remember it for six months. And boy, God, by God, it didn't work. We cut taxes and, and revenue fell off, and then we're, then we're, then we're sunk. So I, that's, yeah. Which is supported primarily by local taxes. 
Right. 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 Public education, I mean, nobody, I, mean, I don't know how it is here. I come from New York. I admit it's a sort of a skewed sample because in New York, nobody, nobody says that kids get educated at all. And that's, that's out. <laughs> well, I'm, but, but, but I mean, it's a you know, multi-billion dollar school system. Uh, most of the, I, I attended an education conference a couple of years ago with, which included liberals, leftists, right-wingers, a whole spectrum of people. And they started off by stipulating, they admitted, all of them admitted that, that public schools don't educate, right? They, they stipulate, okay, we admit they don't educate. However, what was the argument? The, the argument of the liberals, the last people left really in favor of the public school system, the argument they gave in favor of public education was, was a massive babysitting device. You get, <laughs> you get the kids out of your hair for eight hours or whatever, and the taxpayers pay for it. That's really what it amounts to. Because you can, because they, they can, but they weren't in the public school, they can pick up in three weeks at Berlitz or at some course or whatever. So, uh, uh, now of course my answer to that is in, in New York, New York City, where we're on the cutting edge of America, it's no longer a babysitting function. You can get, it's worth your life to enter the public school system in New York. So anybody who can possibly do it gets their kid out of the public school and gets them in the private school, even though, of course, you're paying double. You're paying the taxes to the rotten public school system plus the tuition you have to pay to the private school system. So what I would advocate as a transition, in a sense, is to have tax credits for private tuition. In other words, if you pay... $5,000 a year for private school, you should be able to deduct that from your income tax off the top, not deductible, but as a tax credit off the top. But that was due, that isn't due because it's tax supported, that's because something has happened to our teaching, our teaching well, it's, staff. Well, it's all, it all fits in. Look, look, if, let's, let's put it this way. Supposing if you have, there's all sorts of controversial things about education. I mean, there's there are a whole bunch of topics which you can go either way. You can have traditional or progressive education, sex education or no sex education, religious education or no religious education, a whole bunch of things, right? Whichever way any school, public school system decides, somebody's going to be hurt. Some large group of parents and children will be hurt because their witches will be overridden. If you have a private school system, anybody will go to any darn school they want. The religious schools, religious people support religious schools and whatever. And you have a whole spectrum of schools fulfilling the desires of the various groups of uh, parents and students. You can't have that in public school system. However, however way they decide, some, some large group of people are going to be smashed will feel they've been oppressed by the, by the decision. Even if you have a great public school, even if everything else is great, you still have the inherent nature of the public school system that it's, it's coercing a whole bunch of people, either a majority or a large minority of parents and students. <clears throat> but you don't have it. It's like... Uh, Look, it's as, it's as if there's only one bread in the world. The, the, the tradition has always been the government always makes bread. Okay? Everything else is free, but the government has to make bread. And then the question is, what kind of bread do they make? And there's a big conflict. Every, there's only one bread for each city or each town. Should it be Wonder Bread type? Should it be Pepperidge Farm? Should it be this health crap and all that sort of thing? <laughs> and there's a, <laughs> there's a big conflict over this, right? However, whichever way the government decides, a lot of parent, a lot of bread users will be will be oppressed by this. They won't be able to get the bread they want. So as, as soon as you have government, you have a you have a coercive decision almost automatically. Amen. <laughs>